Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 55, verse 11. Isaiah 55 and verse 11. This morning I'd like to share with you the difference between truth and magical thinking. Let's read. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you're doing among the people of our congregation. And we ask you to help every one of us to clearly understand the power of your truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. No one told Wade Boggs that eating chicken before every game would improve his batting average. But the Boston Red Sox third baseman did it for nearly 20 years. 20 years. Listen to this. Boggs, known for his superstitions, not only ate chicken before every game, earning him the nickname Chicken Man, by the way. He also woke up at the same time every day, took exactly 100 ground balls in practice, took batting practice at 517, and ran sprints at 717. His route to and from his position in the field beat a path to the home dugout. He drew the word, the Hebrew word chai, meaning life, in the batter's box before each time up to bat, even though he was not Jewish. So you may call Wade Boggs a superstitious person, but in reality, he was consumed with what is known as magical thinking. Now, this is a concept I really want you to get this morning, magical thinking. Understand the difference between magical thinking and truth. Let me give you the definition. Magical thinking is an illogical thought, and illogical is the key word there, an illogical thought pattern, and often involves linking actions or events that could not possibly be re related to each other. So basically, magical thinking is a lie. It's buying into an untruth, a lie. For instance, you may believe that simply being kind to someone will keep you from getting caught for stealing supplies from the office. Isn't that funny how our brain works? I know I've done something wrong, but I have this magical thought that if I do enough good to overcome it, I won't get caught. That's magical thinking. Here's another example of magical thinking. John and Susie earn a combined monthly income of $5,000. But because they have no budget and have no clue where their money is going, they spend $5,250 a month, causing them to become delinquent on many bills and overextended on credit card debt. So coming to their wits end, John and Susie cry out to God and ask him to fix their finances. Upon saying amen, they return to the same irresponsible behavior. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, Paul, wait a minute. They prayed. They, they went to God, but they prayed in error. Listen, this is something worth writing down. Satan is a master at turning effective Christian exhortations into ineffective religious rituals. Let me say it again. Satan is a master at turning effective Christian exhortations, the things that we say around church all the time, we hear them, we come to church, uh, they become little uh, cliches where we're quick to say them, and they have great meaning and they're true, but Satan can take those and turn them into ineffective religious rituals, or you could say into magical thinking. In other words, Read your two chapters a day, say your two-minute routine prayer, and everything will work out right. No. No. There's more to it. 
James chapter 1, verse 23 says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, or you could say the truth, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one, this one will be blessed in what he does. A genuine prayer for God's intervention requires us to change our thinking and our actions. It's not just the prayer. It's what we do with the truth that God reveals to us in our time of prayer. It's not just reading scripture. It's what we do with what we learn, the truth that we learn when we study God's word. Matthew 4, 17 says, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. The word repent means to change your thinking. There's actually one translation that says change your thinking. So in other words, I'm going in this direction. This, this is my thinking. I'm headed in this direction. These are my actions. And I realize that these thoughts and these actions are based on lies and they're bringing hardships into my life. I can, I can try and pray them away. I can try and explain them away. But every time I do them, hardship comes into my life. So I'm going to repent. I'm going to change my thinking. I'm going to change my actions. And I'm going to go the other way. And I'm going to allow the truth of God's word to change my circumstances. So if your thinking is wrong, it's based on a lie. And boy, do we buy into Satan's lie. Just look back over your life, the trouble that you've had. You can connect the dots. You bought into a lie. So if the problem is a lie, what's the solution? A truth. The truth. And where do you find the truth? In Scripture and in prayer. Now... I want to go back to my little statement about the cliche, just read your two chapters and say your two-minute routine prayer. When you read scripture, it's not just getting your brownie points for the day and saying, you know, I've read my two chapters, I'm a good Christian. And I said my template prayer, which by the way, I have one. I actually have two. I have one for the morning and one for the evening. But I'm very careful for it not to just be ritual. I do it because I'm a creature of habit and I don't want to miss anything. There's certain things I want to pray for every day. But if that's all you do, it's ineffective. So somebody comes to church and they hear you should read your Bible and pray every day. So they go home and they read two chapters. They say a quick prayer and nothing seems to change. The bottom line is because they're not finding the truth. The truth is not becoming real to them in their time of scripture study in their time of prayer they're just reciting ritualistic prayers and not opening themselves up to the wisdom that God has for them uh, I recommend two ways of studying scripture to make it come alive one is by studying a particular book of the Bible like the book of James if you open it up and say okay I want to learn everything about this book I want to learn who James was was this James the brother of John or was this uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, what time in history was this, this letter written? Who was it written to? What was going on? It begins to open up like a movie, and when you put it down one day, you can't wait to pick it up the next day and continue reading it because you're, you're moving through a, a story that's coming to life. And as you consume this scripture, it becomes part of you. The truth begins to settle in your mind and begin to change your thinking. And you, you read that the wrath of, of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So the next time you have the knee-jerk reaction to go off on somebody, you remember that. Truth has replaced a lie. And it changes your actions. It changes the way you live. And when you change the way you live, your circumstances begin to change and new life begins to spring forth. Things begin to heal, to get better and go better. Why? Because you prayed a, a, a ritualistic prayer or read two quick chapters? No, because you have replaced the lie with the truth. 
When you pray, Jesus said, go into your prayer closet. My daughter actually made her closet a prayer closet. <laughs> she would go in, it was a good sized closet, she got the good bedroom. And she would pray, as a matter of fact, it was so sweet. Um, of course, she's married now, I can't, um, I can't say what's happened to her since she married that guy. <laughs> I'm teasing. He's a wonderful young man. We could not be happier. But when she lived with us, no, I'm teasing. She had a, one of those giant post-it notes. And let me say once again, we, he, she's married to a wonderful young man. We love Austin Bailey. Um, she had this giant post-it note that, that had her prayers <laughs> written out. And she would literally go in there and close herself in and pray and give her heavenly father time to speak back to her i call it uh, when i do it i call it my daily download of wisdom uh, another thing you'll learn reading james if you read that book and study it is that if you need wisdom all you have to do is ask for god and he'll give it to you liberally and without reproach you can ask as many times as you want to He'll download that wisdom to you. She would go in there and she would not come out until she got that wisdom, until she got that truth, that specific truth for the specific things that she was going through that day. And that truth changed things. When you get God's truth, it changes your circumstances. Now, somebody might think, isn't prayer magical thinking? No. It's not. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Doesn't that sound kind of like magical thinking? A little, is it? No. Why? Because faith is in line with and based on God's word, on God's truth. The problem is too many of us don't take the time to go into our prayer closet and hear God's word. We don't take the time to study the scriptures to hear what our Heavenly Father is telling us. We don't, we don't invest the time that it takes to, to discover the lie that we've bought into and repent and go the opposite way and change our thinking. And by the way, we're not just too busy because we're doing evil things. My guess is most everybody in here is a Christian and you don't pursue evil things. The distraction could actually be something else very good. One of my biggest distractions that I have to guard against keeping me from God's word is ministry. I wake up, my feet hit the floor, I go running 90 miles an hour, and next thing I know, the day is over. I've spent my whole day ministering, but didn't have time to pray and didn't have time to study scripture. I was trying to minister truth, but bypassing the opportunity to get truth for myself. Don't be distracted. Romans 12, 2 says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Those 650 people in financial peace are transforming their finances. Their, their finances are turning around. A, a million dollars worth of turnaround between, between the whole group. That's not just happening by chance. That's not just happening because they're showing up for a class and checking their name off on the attendance sheet and saying, I showed up. It's happening because they are hearing the truth of God's word about their finances and they're applying the truth of God's word to their finances. And their finances are being transformed. This concept of truth versus magical thinking is not only true for finances. It's true in every area of life. Every area of life. 
If you're having relationship problems, maybe you have bought into a lie. Maybe you picked something up along the way that for you has become magical thinking. If I just do this, everything will work out right. Maybe it's uh, a problem with your children. Maybe it's a problem uh, in your vocation, on your job. Things are just not working out. It seems like everything is going wrong. There's, there's hardship. You, you might say, well, Paul, what about grace? We sang about grace this morning. Listen, grace is God keeping you alive through your circumstances until you get it. Until you get it, you can uh, drive 90 miles an hour in a 50 mile an hour uh, speed zone and uh, pray, God, don't let me get a speeding ticket. And he may keep you alive through it. But guess what? Every time you speed through the speed zone, you're still going to get a ticket. Grace doesn't excuse the truth. Grace <laughs> keeps you alive until you get it. Pursue the truth. I started out with Isaiah 55, 11, and I want to come back to it. It says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. My word, God's word, never returns void. Why? Because God's word is truth. And truth always, always, always works. And then it goes on to say whatever it's spoken into will prosper. Now the person has to receive it and apply it. But if God's word is spoken into your situation, either through scripture or time with him in prayer or in a service like this, or on television, however God's word is spoken into your circumstances, if you receive it and apply it, it will bring forth life, your, your circumstances, your life will begin to prosper. And I know we're talking about a financial peace a lot uh, these days, but this word prosper does not just mean in your finances. It means in whatever area you've applied truth. So if you're having problems in relationships and you apply God's truth to those situations, your relationships will begin to prosper. God's word will prosper your life when you apply it because God's truth brings life. Now the enemy wants you to buy into magical thinking. He would absolutely love for you to continue in your wrong thinking and think that if you eat chicken before every game, <laughs> your batting average will go up. Sometimes they don't always look like superstition. Sometimes it may just be something that we've got in our mind and we think, as long as I do this, I'm going to be okay. You know, I came to church this morning I know I've made havoc of my life all week, but I came to church this morning, so God must be okay with me. Everything's going to go good now because I went to church this morning. Well, I'm glad you're in church this morning, but you have to apply the truth that you learned in church this morning before your life will prosper. The enemy wants you to buy into magical thinking. Your heavenly Father wants you to buy in to truth. So, here's today's memory verse. It's probably been a while since you've had a memory verse. Proverbs 23, 23. Easy to remember. Proverbs 23, 23. It's very simple. Buy the truth and don't sell it. Buy the truth don't sell it. Not even at the big yard sale we've got coming up. To buy doesn't literally mean pay for it. It just means do whatever you've got to do to get it. If you've got to study scripture for two hours a day, do what it takes. If you've got to go in your prayer closet for hours 
to get the answers that you need, do it. Do whatever it takes to get the truth. And when you get the truth, don't sell it. Don't sell out to the enemy. When the temptation comes to sell out and go back to the lie, to go back to magical thinking, don't sell out to the enemy. Buy the truth and don't sell it. I'm going to pray and dismiss you, but I want to uh, invite you after that prayer. If you desire truth and you want this to be the day that you begin to pursue it, maybe you don't even know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You're not even connected to the truth. You don't have to go another day. You don't have to continue to go through hardships without the truth. Today can be the day that you're connected. So I want to encourage you to come to the front, and I want to ask uh, pastors and elders in the church to be watchful, uh, to pray with anyone that comes. This can be the day. Even if you're a Christian and you have tried, but you haven't been connecting, this can be the day that you connect with truth. By truth. And don't sell it. Let's pray. Father, help us to discern the difference between magical thinking and truth. And help us to buy the truth and never, never sell it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.